It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the ASUS PG27AQDM. The OSD is controlled by a joystick which faces down beneath the little central protrusion on the bottom bezel, so it faces away from you. There are also two little buttons. The first button there, that's customizable, it's a shortcut key, I've got that set to brightness. The second button, to the right of the joystick, that's the power button, dedicated power button. And if you press that once, it says turn on or turn off. So if you press that again, it will turn off. If the screen is in a low power state, so it's lost signal to the system, then you just have to press that button once and it will turn the monitor off. I found that if the monitor had just lost signal and I pressed that button, it kind of got confused and it seemed to go into a standby state, which is a bit odd, and I couldn't really do anything unless I turned the system on again, then it kind of sprung back to life. So my general recommendation would be to basically wait until the signal's lost before turning the monitor off if you're going to do it like that, or just make sure you turn the monitor off before the signal's actually lost. So in terms of shortcut functionality, if you press the joystick to the left or press it in, then that's how you get into the main menu. If you press the joystick up, down, or to the right, they are three different shortcuts. So you've got four shortcuts you can configure in total, because remember there's that other button that's not the power button and not the joystick. If you go to my favorite shortcut, that's how you can configure them. So you can see that there's a shortcut for right, up, down, and that first button. Various different options here. There's Game Plus, Game Visual, Brightness, Mute, Shadow Boost, Contrast, Input Select, HDR Setting, Blue Light Filter, Volume, Customize Setting 1 and Customize Setting 2. And these Customize Settings are useful. So you can make whatever changes you want in any section of the menu. You can then save that to Setting 1 or Setting 2, and then you can easily recall those settings. Before diving into the settings in my usual detailed fashion. I'm actually going to look at just a selection of these settings and I'm going to try and address the question, what are the best settings for this monitor? Now that's very subjective, it depends on your own preferences, it depends on your unit. So when I say best settings, what I'm really talking about are the settings which worked on my unit for my preferences and according to the targets which I go for when I review with my colorimeter. So the first thing to be aware of in system setup is a power setting option. And if you have that set to power saving mode, when you actually first use the monitor, first turn it on, it should say it's going to be in standard mode. Do you want to switch over to power saving instead? You'd have to actually select that. So it should be in standard mode. But if you have it set to power saving mode, you'll see that a lot of the menus locked off. So if you find a lot of this is grayed out and you're not running in HDR, and I'll come on to that shortly, it's probably that you've got this power saving mode enabled. It will really restrict what you can do. So I've now got it on standard mode. And it's also activated a few things I didn't have activated before. But fortunately, as I was showing you before, if you're watching the OSD video, the full OSD video, you can save sets of settings and very easily recall them. So I have things as they were before. Actually, no, I don't. It's basically done a factory reset. So be very careful with this power mode. Don't change this unless you really have to. Make sure you change it as really the first thing you do because it seems to wipe your settings, which is a bit of a pain. I'm gonna to have to set everything up again. Okay, so I've set that all up again. In a way, it was useful because it reminded me of all the settings that actually changed and why I changed them. So first up, you've got Adaptive Sync. This would be called VRR if you're using HDMI 2.1 VRR. It's called HDMI 2.1 VRR, although it's actually an HDMI 2.0 port. If you look at the bandwidth, it does have HDMI 2.1 capabilities, including HDMI 2.1 VRR. A little bit confusing, but basically this might be called VRR if that's what you're using. Otherwise, it'll be called Adaptive Sync. Whatever it's called, it'll be the first option in the gaming section. If you want to be using VRR, you have to have this set to on. Game visual, they're the presets of the monitor. The default racing mode is really very good, in my opinion, it gives you good flexibility. But really, these settings, uh, scenery mode is very funky, by the way. They just really set things to different values by default, and some of them will lock certain settings off. And the scenery mode clearly looks funky, but if you try to replicate this in a different preset, it wouldn't look quite the same. So it does seem to make some adjustments beyond just what you can see in the menu. For example, there's extreme oversaturation and crushing of shades. 
but the saturation is set to the correct default value of 50, the correct neutral value of 50. Anyway, it's more of the same with other settings as well. FPS mode gives you oversaturation. It also lowers your gamma to try and increase visibility. So if you find this useful competitively and you like how it's set up, of course, feel free to use it. So it's got shadow boost set to level three. That's a gamma enhancement, which targets mainly darker shades and lightens them up for that boost in visibility. And again, it gives you a saturation boost, which doesn't seem to correspond with the values here. sRGB mode, I wouldn't recommend using this. I mean, it is useful, except it is no more useful than using one of the other presets. Racing mode and user mode being the best balanced, but instead you can go to color, display color space, and change that from DCI P3, which uses the full native gamut of the monitor. That'll give you the highest vibrancy, the strongest saturation, to sRGB. And that will clamp the gamut close to sRGB, which gives you more faithful output for most SDR content, which is designed around the sRGB color space. And with this active, this setting, it doesn't lock off anything else. You can adjust the brightness, you can adjust the color channels, the gamma. You get full control over everything. And I did briefly mention that user mode just going to show you MOBA. That's really funky. Maybe useful for MOBA games. I don't know. I don't play them. User mode. So that's really like racing mode, but you actually have a few more settings you can adjust if you wish to. There's saturation and six axis saturation. So the saturation slider, this is something you would adjust according to preferences. I don't really consider this a best setting. The best setting would just be to leave this alone. That gives you the more neutral the most neutral and as intended look. But if you wish to decrease this a little bit, you just find saturation a little bit too intense, for example, then you can do that. Just be aware that it's difficult to get the balance right. And I do find that some shades are undersaturated and others remain quite strongly saturated. It's just difficult to balance. There's also six axis saturation if you want more control over that kind of thing, but the same really applies. So for example, if you lower the red a bit, some red bias shades don't look quite right and others have perhaps more appropriate saturation. But if you don't like how things look without these adjustments, please do feel free to make them. Be aware that if you increase anything beyond 50, then you're going to increase the saturation by pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut without increasing the gamut itself. So that means you're crushing things together and you're losing shade variety. The next setting which I would focus on Brightness, this is something you adjust according to your own preferences and your room lighting. For me, with the other adjustments I make as well, that will affect the brightness levels. I found 64 worked well. That was, again, for my unit, my preferences, and my colorimeter targets. Uniform brightness, generally you'll want to have this switched on. What it'll do is it will mean that the monitor doesn't really use any ABL, automatic brightness limiter, or a very limited ABL will be used. This means that the brightness is pretty stable, so it's not going to fluctuate all over the place depending on how much bright content is being displayed on the screen. If you have uniform brightness disabled, then it can potentially go brighter, but it does depend on the content displayed. I didn't specifically touch anything else here, but in the evening I like to use low blue light settings. However, I don't like the implementation of low blue light on this particular monitor. That's because level 1, 2 and 3 actually give you higher blue light output than the factory defaults, which is pretty useless. Level 4 does reduce your blue light output, but also gives you a green tint. This is all explored in the written review. But an alternative low blue light setting is to go to color and change color temp to 4000K. For my regular settings, my test settings, I use the user setting here. I left red at 100, green is set to 93, and blue is set to 80. But this depends on your unit. They're not all going to be calibrated in the same way and things can drift over time as well. So this is just at the time of review on my unit, what worked for me to get 6,500K with a good neutral green channel as well. The gamma, I left that at 2.2. Again, that's my target. If you want things to look deeper, then you could select 2.4, potentially 2.6. If you want things to look, let's say more visible, kind of washed out really, you can select 1.8, but less of that, 2.0. But I think most people should really just stick to 2.2 unless you really just prefer a different setting or you have a work reason for using a different setting. And that's really all I changed for my test settings. Things are different under HDR. So I've got HDR running on the monitor. So you'll see that a lot of this is now greyed out. The main settings that you should focus on, yes, you can use VRR at the same time as HDR if you wish. The HDR setting. 
three different modes on my NVIDIA GPU, whether I was using HDMI or whether I was using DisplayPort, these were exactly the same. It may depend on your firmware, it could potentially depend on your system or your GPU. So I would advise trying these out, seeing if they do differ for you and just selecting the one you prefer really. The other setting of interest under HDR is color temp. You can set that to 6500K, which gives you a nice neutral white point, a natural look. 8200K, that actually was higher than 8200K on my unit, depends on the brightness. So that is really a cool look, and I don't mean cool as in a good look, I mean cool as in a cool tinted look, very icy look. And that can accelerate visual fatigue, especially if you consider the high brightness levels which are being pumped out under HDR. The reason that they give you this option is because it will increase the brightness capability a bit, but it isn't exactly what I consider a huge difference in that respect. Yes, it gives you an edge, but the brightness capability, to be honest, is not massively different to the 6500K setting, and I just feel that the balance of the image is much better with that 6500K setting. There's also a brightness adjustable setting. I definitely don't consider using this a best setting, but there is a specific use case. So if you try and activate this, it says HDR PQ curve will be affected when the brightness adjustment is on under HDR mode. That means that if you lower the brightness, it doesn't neatly map things it's really optimized for the brightness to be set to 100, which is the same as having this setting disabled. But what this does is it unlocks your brightness slider. And if you really find things uncomfortable, you can't bear to look at the screen under HDR, you still want to use some of your HDR benefits, then you can reduce this. Because this is an OLED screen, it is worth exploring the screen protection features, which are found in the system setup section of the menu. First one there is screensaver. I'd leave this on. It's quite a good feature actually, I find. And what this will do is it will dim the screen if it isn't detecting much of a change in the display signal for several minutes. So it won't react to things like the clock changing, little movements, a blinking cursor, that kind of thing. It will ignore that. That won't stop it activating. But what it will do is it will dim the screen significantly and that can help reduce your chance of image retention or burn-in issues. And that's really what these screen protection features are designed around, because this is an OLED screen. I didn't have any issues with this during my brief review period, but of course that is a brief review period, so I can't speak for longer term use, and it is worth taking a few precautions. So the screensaver is particularly useful. You don't have to be on the desktop for this to activate. If you had a game paused and there's not much going on in the game, then it could activate this feature as well. But in addition to this, I would recommend setting your power settings in Windows to turn the display off after a brief period of inactivity. I actually set it to 20 minutes in my review, but that's because I like to have the monitor warm and in a stable state for my review. But if I was just a regular user of the monitor, I would set this to something like perhaps five minutes or less. If you go away from the monitor, you're not using it and you're on the desktop, it will just turn the screen off or put it into a low power state. Next up, there's pixel cleaning. This is something you activate manually by selecting this option. It's a little bit awkward actually. So when you use this, what will happen is the power LED will blink amber and the screen will look like it's switched off. It'll take about six minutes, as it says. Now, the reason I said it's awkward is that the monitor has a little reminder system. You can disable this if you want, but otherwise you can set it to two hours, four hours or eight hours. There are actually other options if you're using Display Widget Center, which I'll show you at the end of the OSD video if you're watching the full OSD video. But this just gives you a little message towards the bottom right of the screen. And the message doesn't have an option to actually run the cycle, so you then have to go kind of deep into the menu to run it, which is a little bit weird. Asus did say when I asked about it that it should automatically run the cycle, apparently after eight hours of use, but I've used the monitor for longer than that, cumulatively, without running the cycle, and it hasn't done it. So I'm not sure if it does do it automatically, or if it does, maybe it's a longer period. So my general recommendation, if you don't mind the reminder and you find that useful, then set it. Otherwise, just try and remember to do it, perhaps before you go to bed, maybe if you're making a meal. You don't have to be too obsessive with this, and certainly run it if you do notice some image retention on the screen and you want to try and get rid of that. But just try and run it when you can remember, you know, a few times a day. That should really be sufficient. Next, there is screen move. This is a setting which I really don't like. It was set to middle because that's the default setting, but I would like to set that to off. Thank you very much. Now, what this will do is it will cause the entire image to move so it's displaced. There's an active area 
between the panel border and the actual image. And unfortunately, even if you use the light setting here, it will actually run off the screen completely. So you'll lose some of the image when this is running. And it seems to run for several minutes at a time. So I find it extremely annoying, even with the light setting. The other settings will cause even more movement. The thing to remember about this setting though, I mean, if you don't find any of these settings annoying, then of course, just feel free to leave them enabled. I'm just saying what I like to do here. But yes, if you are using this, then it's only even with a strong setting gonna give you a reasonably slight movement. And that means that larger white elements, some of that, the center of larger objects, for example, they're gonna remain illuminated in the same way. So this isn't really just a be all and end all of preventing image retention. It's just sort of one mitigation measure. And I really wouldn't feel too bad about disabling this. It can certainly help with the edges of bright shades and that kind of thing. And smaller bright elements can help prevent image retention or burn in there, but it's really only gonna do so much. Next, you've got Adjust Logo Brightness. This is disabled by default, and I disabled it in the review just for consistency and because I didn't want this to kick in and cause any sort of issues with my observations or readings. But if you don't find this annoying or you don't really notice it doing anything, then that's probably a good thing. Just leave it set to on. If you do find it annoying, again, you can set it to off. They do give you that option. Potential issues with this kind of feature. It doesn't know exactly what a logo is and what's gonna be non-disruptive. It could include HUD elements in a game. It could include various UI elements, which you don't necessarily want to be dimmed. So just be aware that it may not be something that you want to leave on. So I'm now gonna focus on the remaining settings. Game plus, various different options here. There's an FPS counter. You can have a number or a graph. That gives you a little, well, actually a fairly large, I should say, number, which will correspond to your frame rate if you've got VRR active and it's within its variable refresh rate range. So you can see that's changing in accordance with the fluctuations in frame rate. There's a bar graph if you prefer, so that just gives you a little bit of history for the frame rate fluctuations as well. If you want to activate the crosshair, by the way, that will get rid of the FPS counter. So you can only have one of these active at the same time, but I've now just put this little light blue dot on the Jaguar's nose there. And if you use the joystick, you can adjust the position of that dot. So you don't have to have it right in the middle of the screen. So you can see there are different dot designs. There's a green dot. It's not sure if you'll be able to see this in the video, but this is a slightly different design. It sort of has four little sections. Again, blue or green. There's a cross. And there's dynamic crosshair. You can control the design, by the way, if you prefer a cross, for example. And this will try and contrast with the background, although it seems to have selected a color there, which is blending in quite nicely with the Jaguar's nose there. So that's a bit curious. But you can see it does try and change so it contrasts with the background. It might have just been, yeah, it's doing it pretty well now. It might have just been that it, when I first activated, it wasn't quite calibrated properly. I'm, I'm not sure how it works exactly, but yeah, seems to work pretty well. Next, there's what they call Sniper. So this will zoom in a central section of the screen by various different levels. Okay, so you can see it's zoomed into that central section there. And that was 1.5 times zoom. You can have two times zoom. And the crosshair design, you can control the color of that little dot right in the middle there as well. And there's timer, which you can set to various different minutes between 30 and 90. And that is in the top left. It just counts down for you. There's also stopwatch. Again, in the top left, that counts up. And there's display alignment, which will give you a grid around the screen just to help you line up multiple displays. Next, there's Shadow Boost, and I've got legom.nl, the website open, and the tests for black levels there. This doesn't appear on the video as you'll see it by eye, but it will give you a relative idea of what this setting does. Level one gives you a bit of a boost, so that increases the depth of these darker shades, actually increases them too much. If you look at it in terms of accuracy, it really does lower the gamma quite a bit here, so that's not good for accuracy. Level two higher, level three higher again. 
but this isn't for accuracy this is to give you a bit of an edge competitively speaking to make enemies easy to spot in dark backgrounds for example there's also dynamic adjustment which seems to be actually quite a bit stronger so even when i set level three some of these blocks are more blended than i'd expect for this kind of setting dynamic adjustment gives more of a boost and it looks at the content and it sort of decides how much of a boost to give based on that, or that's what it's supposed to do. It also doesn't raise the black depth. I'm not sure if you'll see this in the video, but the depth of the black ground, the black background remains the same regardless of what you select here. So it's a bit more selective than that. And by the way, that's dark gray, that's not black, which is why that lightens up and the camera can compensate in various ways. So yeah, for a competitive edge, have a play with this if you want. Most accurate image, leave that off. Next up, there's image. Brightness, which I've been through. Uniform brightness, I've also been through. Contrast, usual contrast control. Default value is 80. That was certainly optimal on my unit, and generally you shouldn't really have to change contrast, but if you do need to change it, try not to make massive adjustments. Vivid pixel, this is a sharpness control set to 50 by default. That is the correct neutral point, but if you want to adjust this, you can. If you want things to look less sharp or more sharp, be aware that regardless of what you set this to, it doesn't help with the fringing issues, which are due to the sub-pixels and explored in the review. HDR settings grayed out unless you're using HDR. I showed you that earlier. There's aspect control, full, which will use all pixels of the screen. Equivalent, which is sometimes called aspect on other monitors. That will look at the aspect ratio and try not to distort the image, but will use as much of the screen as it can without that distortion. So I've switched over to the full HD resolution, which isn't native, so you can see it says 1920 by 1080 at 240 hertz now. Equivalent, that will be the same as full because this is a 16 by 9. Okay, well, eating my words there, it should have been the same. And what this does is it uses as much of the screen as it can without stretching and distorting the image, but it seems to have squashed things up, although it is a 16 by 9 resolution. And that actually changed my resolution over to 1920 by 1440, but I did select Full HD before, so if I now select Full HD with that selected, it fills up all of the screen, so that is paying attention to the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So I'm not sure why it auto-switched it. So if I set that back to full, same thing. And if I now select Equivalent, It is correctly filling up the entire screen, as I'd expect, given that it's a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And there's one-to-one, -one, which just uses the pixels called for in the source resolution without any interpolation required. So this is a perfect Full HD experience with a large black border around the image. Because this is an OLED, the black border is extremely deep. That is to say, dark looking, particularly in a dim room. And you might have noticed it did tell you when you're using these settings, other than the default, that it disables adaptive sync. There's also a 16 by 9 setting, which will simulate a 25 inch screen, so that's a little bit smaller. So there's a black border and the image takes up less of the screen. You've got blue light filter next, which I've been through. I've been through most of these as well. In fact, I've been through all of the color menu already. Input select. so. You can select input auto detection if you want the screen to decide which input it's using for you, if you've got multiple devices connected, or you can have it so you can manually select that instead. Next, I'm gonna look at the lighting effects of the monitor. But the only lighting feature, if you want to call it that, that I've got active is that little logo. And that's actually the power signal indicator or the power indicator. So if you find that logo annoying, you can disable that. And this glows amber when the screen is in a low power state, so it loses signal to the system. And it flashes amber if the screen is doing its pixel refresh cycle. The remaining features, they call this Aura RGB, but actually the base is not RGB at all. It's just red and you can have it set to high. So there's a projector, downward firing projector. There's also a little red chevrony thingy there, one on the left side. One on the right side, plus swift lettering on the back of the stand neck. So you can just have that disabled, high or low, and it just controls all of that. And there's rear cover, which I find more interesting, but annoyingly enough, it just faces my wall, as it will with many people watching the video. You can set that to 
rainbow. So that's that little eye icon there. Nice little grid pattern. I think it looks kind of cool. But again, I don't really get to appreciate it. You can set it to color cycle, which will keep it all more or less one color, whereas the rainbow transitioned in a sort of gradient effect. You can select a static color, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, or yellow. I'll just show you yellow. I'm not going to show you all of these. I'm sure you can use your imagination. There's breathing, and you can control the color of the breathing effect. And there's strobing. Again, you can control the colour. There's also software, I think it's called Aura Creator or something like that, which would allow you to customise it in more ways. But to be honest, I think for most of you, you're not really going to look at it very much, if at all. And if you do have your screen somewhere where the rear is visible, you're probably going to be satisfied with the options available in the OSD anyway. There's my favourite, which I've been through. System setup, you can change the language the OSD is displayed in. Change the volume of anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. This monitor does not include integrated speakers, or you can mute that. You can select so the USB hub is on or off during standby. If you're not using the USB ports, I'd recommend just keeping that off during standby because they'll use a little bit of power if you have them on during standby, even if you're not actually using the ports. Power indicator, which I showed you just before. Power key lock, that means you can't use the power key. Pretty self-explanatory. Key lock, and it says, check quick start guide to cancel this function. I'll consult my brain rather than the quick start manual as I've used a few ASUS monitors before. If you press the joystick in the down direction for a few seconds, keys unlocked. Screen protection, which I've been through. Power setting, which I've also been through. OSD setup, you can change the position of the OSD on the screen. Change the timeout period. So how long after the last button press before it automatically disappears? You can set that between 10 and 120 seconds. Set the transparency level. DDC slash CI, you need to have that enabled to use the plug and play functionality of the monitor to control the monitor using software. And you don't need a USB cable connected to do that if you're using Display Widget Center, for example, and I will show you that shortly. This information gives you some information about the monitor. And you notice it said VRR. No, that's because I don't have VRR active, although I do generally like to use that. So I'm just going to set the correct aspect control setting so I can enable that. And now it says VRR supported. Also gives you your firmware version. I'm using MCM 103, which is the latest firmware available at the time of testing. And all reset, which will reset everything to the factory default, which I don't fancy doing again. So display widget center. There's a link to download this in the description of the video. Quite simple software. It doesn't have all of the options that you get in the OSD. You can see it takes a little while to load. And I was messing around before a while back and it seems to have remembered what I was messing around with in my last state. Just in case, what I'd recommend if you've got your settings set up exactly as you like them, make use of those shortcut keys and the customized settings thing I showed you before, because if this display widget happens to mess things up, you can just reload your settings. Although perhaps if I selected racing, it would have been fine anyway. I don't know, but either way, this is how I like things to be set up. And anyway, you can control the brightness, contrast, overdrive. That's peculiar. There's absolutely nothing on this monitor. It doesn't have an overdrive control. It's an OLED monitor. Blue light filter. Set that to the four different levels. Shadow boost. You'll see there isn't an option for adaptive or whatever it was called. It's just level one, level two, level three or off. Some settings which aren't applicable, like easy smart contrast ratio, dynamic contrast rubbish, which is definitely not needed on an OLED and shouldn't really be used on an LCD. Apologies if I offend anyone who likes that kind of setting. Saturation and hue, that's not available in this particular preset. But if I switch over to the user setting, for example, I can adjust those settings. And you'll see if you haven't pressed save, then it will just discard the settings if you switch over to another preset, for example. So if you don't like the changes you've made here, you don't have to press save. Different color temp settings. These are completely different to what I showed you in the OSD. Remember, there were actually different Kelvin values. 
whereas this says cool, normal, warm, or user, but you can select user if you want to manually configure the red, green, and blue color channels. And I'm not sure why it's reset these to 100. I definitely didn't have things set to 100 before. So that's interesting. And by interesting, I mean slightly annoying. Yep, it's reset them. But again, this is why I do recommend saving things to your customized settings. And now that should have corrected the color channels with the adjustments I had before. Fingers crossed. Yep, there we go. You've got some Game Plus options, which I showed you before, just another way of configuring them. Quite a neat way of doing it, quite a nice little UI. OLED setup, so these are your OLED related options. Things I showed you, the little mitigation measures earlier. Target mode isn't applicable on this model, so that's greyed out. If you press apply, it'll run through the pixel cleaning cycle. And these are different. You get more options for the pixel cleaning cycle reminder if you set it up in ASUS Display Widget Center. I think it was just two, four, and eight before, so you've got more options here. And screen move, again, that's set to middle. I want that to be set to off, but please do feel free to use that setting if you don't mind it. The system settings, it has an HDR toggle, the same as the one in Windows. It's just another way of activating HDR. You can do it here. We'll activate the Windows toggle. You can set it to automatically hide the taskbar if you wish. That's not something I do. However, I would recommend using a dark theme. I'm not sure if that's here, but you can select the default Windows theme and the... So maybe that does change the taskbar. It doesn't seem to. Anyway, I would recommend using a dark taskbar, if nothing else, as if you're not automatically hiding that, it will be on the screen a lot. You don't want that to be really bright and potentially causing image retention if you spend a lot of time on the desktop. And there's the power setting, standard mode or power saving mode. Application settings, this allows you to update the software. It says there's no update available. If you have this set to automatic, it will just do it itself as soon as a new version is available. This isn't firmware for the monitor, by the way. This is just the application itself. The firmwares for the monitor, they're found on ASUS's website on the product page. There is a link to that in the vision review if you're interested, just at the bottom of the test settings section, right at the end of the calibration section. I was going to say you can select the language, I think of the OSD, but it doesn't let me do that. And gaming, or well, maybe this is for the application, sorry, yes, application settings. But these are grayed out. I guess you can download language packs and different themes if you want, but I'm not really interested in that. It's also information log for service use only. So this is really if something happens on the, this application, which gives you an error or something's not working as it should, and you want to report that to ASUS, you can do that. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG27AQDM. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, nice way of showing your support.